Testing one, two. Welcome everyone in the building. First of all, to those in the building, a big welcome to Tubal. Hey. So Tubal is with us this morning. For those on Facebook, we are blessed to have our, quite a few people in the building this morning, which is really, really amazing. And it's just so good to see so many smiling, happy faces. And I know those on Facebook this morning, you're also smiling. You're having a good time. Don't forget, we're going to repeat the service at 5 o'clock on YouTube. So if you've got friends or family that you feel need to watch this service, get them on YouTube a bit later. But this is a beautiful day. God has given us an incredibly beautiful day. Yesterday was cold. It was raining. There was even snow. I know where I was staying, there was even hail. Yo, it was crazy. But today is a beautiful day, and we want to give God all our thanksgiving, everything that we have within us, give Him praise and glory. So come on, let's, let's open this time in prayer in your homes, your lounges, wherever you are. Praise God this morning, because He is good, and He's good all the time. Come on, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we honor You, we praise You, we glorify You, Jesus. Yes, you have the name that's above every other name. And Lord, today we want to glory in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Come on, let's give him praise.
And I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. And I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Turn it for good. You turn it for 
good, declared in this place, church. Cause you take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. church in this place this morning, whether you're in the church building, whether you're at home on YouTube later, whether you're on Facebook, there's power in this declaration, church. This isn't just a song. It's not just a mixture of words put together. It's a declaration. God takes anything that's been put in your life and He works it for the better. There's always a way out and there's always a way through, church. Let's sing that again. Sing, you take. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil. You turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. And I'm gonna see a victory, but we're gonna see a victory for the battle. And I'm going to see a victory, I'm going to see a victory, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. It doesn't matter what you've done, church. It doesn't matter where you've come from, church. It doesn't matter where you're going, church. The battle belongs to Jesus, and there's going to be a victory in our lives, church. Let's declare it in this place. Lord, we're going to see a victory this morning, church. The victory. And I'm going to see a victory, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. And I'm going to see a victory, I'm going to see a victory, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. Oh, yes, Lord. The Bible tells us of many occasions where 
God's people were outnumbered, where victory seemed impossible. Sometimes three armies would gather against God's people. Sometimes the impossibility would be an army coming towards you and a sea in front of you. Sometimes the impossibility was a fortress like Jericho. Sometimes that impossibility was a giant that would overpower you. Sometimes that impossibility would be thousands of people hungry and you have nothing to feed them with. But when the battle is the Lord's, then nothing can stand in the way of God's children seeing victory. Even in the midst of this lockdown, even in the midst of a financial crisis in the year 2020, our God is still the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He will not change. And I believe we're on the verge, we're on the brink. Someone listening to me today, you, you're on the brink of not just believing for a victory, but actually seeing it because the battle is the Lord's. Can you imagine for a moment what that must feel like when everyone around you is telling you there's just defeat, when everyone around you is just spreading bad news, when everyone around you is saying give up hope, then all of a sudden you get the small, still voice inside of you saying and whispering in your ear, you're going to see a victory because the battle is the Lord's. As we were singing the song, I saw a picture that is so contrary, so wrong, it's just so opposite to what we believe. I saw a boxer in a ring fighting an opponent. This opponent was bigger and stronger than him. And I don't know if you've ever watched boxing, but that bell rings and the two guys come together and they touch gloves normally. And then they go for it. But this picture was so different. As the bell rang, the opposition, the, the, the enemy came steaming forward. And instead of rushing forward to attack him, I saw this boxer drop to one knee and look up. And I saw the word victory. You see, some of us, we're expecting a fight. Amen. We're expecting someone to come attack us. We're expecting that enemy to come rushing at us. And everything inside of this person is saying, well, rush them. You go and take them. And God is saying, kneel before me. Kneel before me. Submit to God. Then resist the enemy and see him flee before you. For someone here today, it's time. Put the gloves down. Put that fighting spirit down. Submit yourself to God and see the victory that is coming your way. I want for those on Facebook in this building, I want us to sing that, just that verse again. I see a victory. But I don't want you just, just like Alex said, it's not just about the words. It's about a declaration today in the name of Jesus. Declare that in your health situation. Declare that in your financial situation. Declare that in your work situation. Declare that in your marriage today. Declare it over your children today. Declare it over your church today. Declare it over your city today. Declare it over your nation today. We will see a victory in Jesus' name. Victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. And I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory for the battle.
right now in the name that's above every other name in the name to which all mankind can be saved in the name of our Lord who died on a cross for us in the name of our champion who rose again to life in the name of Jesus Lord I declare victory for your sons and daughters. No matter what battle they might be battling at the moment, I thank you that, Lord, the battle will now become yours as we kneel before you, as we bow before you, Lord. I thank you that our enemy, Lord, will flee from the presence of our Savior, our champion, Jesus. So, Lord, this week, this week, starting from this day, may we begin to see victories in our lives so we can give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone says a big, loud in the house, amen. Those on Facebook, press the likes, go crazy. It is so awesome that our God is giving us victory in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Those on Facebook, maybe you need to stand because maybe you've been sitting. <laughs> I don't know. But it's just so good to be with you this morning. What a privilege it is for us to be gathered here in the name of Jesus. And I just want to remind all those that are with us today that we are privileged enough to know that this is the day that the Lord has made for us. Amen. Psalm 118. There we go. I, I did speak with that name. Yes, you may, I Andy. Up this and I it to the guy. Yes, it's come, come. That, so. That's no, good. Say, Same scripture. Look yeah. at that. Come on. God is speaking to us. It's a great day. Amen. Well, just a reminder that next week we're going to be uh, launching our services again. We have an 8 o'clock service. We've got a Hopos 9 service here at the church. Then at 3 o'clock at the daily coffee shop, we've got another service. So we're running three services on Sunday, which is really exciting. And uh, the good news and bad news, I don't know how, it depends how you want to look at it. Hopos 9 service is totally booked already. There are some spaces for the 8 o'clock service and there are some spaces for the daily. Now it's very important that you go and What's up the church? Let us know what service you're coming to, number one. And then please commit to that service. Don't say you're coming to the 8 o'clock service. Wake up and think, oh, no, it's too cold. I'll come to the half past nine. You can't come to the half past nine because it's booked, all right? And if you're not coming to the half past nine service, then let us know so that the person in the 8 o'clock service can come to the half past nine service. Make sense? And then everyone's invited to our 3 o'clock service, maximum 50 people as well. It is really going to be amazing. Well, we're going to take up the tithes and the offering uh, uh, this morning. And, you know, the scriptures speak about bringing a sacrifice of thanksgiving. A sacrifice of thanksgiving. That phrase is mentioned many times, specifically in the Old Covenant, as well as times in the New Covenant. A sacrifice of thanksgiving. You know, what is a sacrifice? For some of us, a sacrifice is waking up five minutes early. Am I right? For, for others, a sacrifice might be like, okay, it's my, my day. I'll make coffee for you. There's different uh, theories concerning sacrifice. But if we understand what sacrifice meant in the Bible, it's very different to what we would call sacrifice today. See, sacrifice today is inconvenience. Hello? Yeah, inconvenience. That's a sacrifice. This day and age we live in, inconvenience is a sacrifice. Yet sacrifice in the biblical terms means to offer something of great value. I want you to hear that. To offer something of great value to you. And here's the thing we've got to understand. Today we need to 
differentiate, separate inconvenience compared to great value. Today, to sing a song is not inconvenience and possibly cannot be a sacrifice. But to lift up your hands in church for the first time might be the sacrifice. To actually get excited in praise and worship where perhaps your body might move a little bit might be a sacrifice. Because inside of you, like, I wonder what the guy behind me is going to think. Or perhaps sacrifice means to literally give of your best. So this morning, your praise, give of your best. Your worship, give of your best. Your offering in terms of finances, give of your best. It is called sacrifice. The beauty of sacrifice in the old covenant as well as in the new covenant, it always brought life. When Jesus sacrificed himself on the cross, he didn't give half of himself. He gave all of himself. And what happened? Today we celebrate life. My prayer for our sacrifice of thanksgiving is that whatever we pour in today is going to bring life into your homes, your business, every area of your life. Amen. So let's take up the tithes and offerings at this time. And uh, we've got our bucket again, which will come to the front. You can bring your offering to the front. Those at home, we've got Zappa, we've got EFT, and we also have the offices open. If you want to bring the physical uh, offering, you're more than welcome to do that. The band will play in the background, and then I'll pray over the offering soon. those at home, thank you for sowing. For those in the building, thank you for sowing. We're going to pray that this sacrifice of thanksgiving will produce life even as we've seen through many scriptures where people sacrificed and brought their best to Jesus Christ. So at home, if you can, those in the building as well, let's believe God that the offering we brought before Him is going to produce life in a supernatural, abundant way. Come on, let's pray. So Father, we want to say thank you so much for the privilege of being able to bring this offering before you. Father, to bring this offering and just bring of our best this morning, knowing that, Lord, you sowed your best when you sent Jesus Christ from heaven into this earth. We also pray, Lord, that even now in the name of Jesus, for every single person that brought their best, that, Lord, life would be a blessing from God above. That life would come into our finances. Life would come into our marriages. Life would come into our families, into our church, into our community, Lord. I thank you for newness. I thank you, Lord, for something new and fresh to begin within our lives our families, our homes, our businesses. I thank you for fresh new ideas. I pray for brand new business concepts. I pray, Lord, for brand new relationships to be formed in a special way with you. 
So Father, thank you for the privilege of being able to sow into your kingdom today. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone says again, amen, amen. Thank you to our worship team. Amen. Come on, let's give them a big hand. It was wonderful this morning. Thanks for my water. Oh, I love this water, by the way. To those on Facebook, um, just a reminder, again, that we're going to be starting live services next week. Why that's important is because if you had to ask anyone sitting in this building today, there's really something special about gathering. I know for some of you watching on Facebook, it's, it, you've become very comfortable. It's so nice waking up at 5 to 9, quickly making a cup of coffee, and then sitting down and enjoying the service, which is great. We were forced into it. But there's something different about gathering together. There's something special. And we want to encourage you to, to start making your way back into our services. Excuse me as I take this sip, and I see a lot of people drooling out this amazing water. Look at this. Mm. Just let you know, while you're sipping your coffee at home, this water is good. Well, we're going to get into God's Word this morning, and I'm really excited to be sharing from God's Word, because I believe God's Word brings life. And when we can focus and get God's Word into our hearts and into our lives, in terms of living it out, we will never be the same again. You see, there's certain truths, there's certain concepts in the Scripture that are not meant just to be read, but to be lived out. And when we live these things out, I promise you one thing. What is reflected in the kingdom of God will reflect in our lives. Do you know that our purpose on earth is to usher in the kingdom of God? Our purpose in life is to bring the kingdom of God down to this earth. If you think about it for a moment, when God created man in the beginning he put man in a place of authority he put man in a place where he was supposed to look after the things the creation of God to rule and, and reign in essence ushering in God's presence and we know that Jesus when he died on the cross he came to restore not only our relationship with God but also our position in terms of who God has called us to be. And so when I speak about, and we've been talking about success, we've been talking about success in our homes, our lives, our marriages, every single area, the meaning, the, the actual meaning of success, just to repeat myself, means the accomplishment of an aim or a purpose, not just our personal aims and purposes, but the purpose of God. I want to be successful, not for myself, but I want to be successful in terms of my purpose for which God has called me. Someone uh, sent a message about the fact that Jeremiah preached for 40 years and no one accepted God. No one turned to him. But did you know that Jeremiah was still successful because he was successful in the calling of God upon his life? His success wasn't dependent on the response of people. His success was the response of God who recorded his story in Scripture so that generation from generation from generation would focus on the fact that there was a man that was obedient to God. What an example for us. Was he successful? Absolutely, because today we've got a great example in him. Why? When we are successful in the purposes of God, we please the one who matters the most. You see, we can be pleasing to man. Here's the problem. A lot of times we try to be pleasing to each other, but we forget we're supposed to please God. When you're successful in that, you're successful. It also means to have a favorable or desired outcome. Favorable or desired outcome. Come on, who wants success? No one wakes up in the morning and says, oh, gee whiz, I hope God, I'm going to pray now. God, I pray I'll be unsuccessful. I pray I'm going to be a failure today. Come on, Jesus. No one does that. In fact, that's contrary to who God is. God has not created you to be a failure. God does not create mistakes. He creates sons and daughters of the Most High. So we spoke about a couple of points, and I'm just going to read them out to you just so that we get up to date to where we are. We spoke about successful people make plans, 
and they don't make excuses. We live in a world today where people make so many excuses about everything. I, 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 it's so easy for us, it like rolls off our tongues to make an excuse. Why didn't you do it? Well, the dog ate my homework. I don't know. Successful people live disciplined lives. There's nothing wrong with living a disciplined life. Unsuccessful people just live for the moment. All we want to do is feel good now. Forget about what tomorrow holds. We want our feel good now in this point. And unfortunately, that does not lead you to success. Successful people mix with people, associate with people that actually have dreams and goals. You know, if you mix with a certain group of people, you often get influenced by those people. Who are in, who's influencing your life today? Who are the people that are influencing you for the kingdom of God today? That will either, we said this in youth, where's my youth worker? Get in the back there, doing a great job on Friday nights. I promise you what amazing things are happening in our church with our young people. In fact, there are a whole lot of young people on the sound desk. Just give them a hand in the church. Well done, all the young guys here. Here's the amazing thing. Here's the amazing thing. We tell the youth this. I know when I was a youth pastor, I would always say this because it's truth. Your friends are going to what? Either make you or break you. So the reality is association is important. Successful people face unfairness head on. Come on, we live in a world where everyone has said this at least once in your life. Oh, life's unfair. Because it really is. There's a lot of unfairness in this world, and most of it we cannot control. So we've got to get to a point where we don't run away from unfairness. We don't use unfairness as an excuse. We literally head on. We face it head on. We're not afraid of it, and we'll never use it as an excuse. We find in the Scripture so many times when people face unfairness, God, when He's on your side, will bring you a victory, just like we sang. Successful people use time wisely, understanding that time is a gift. Every day, every moment, every second is a gift from God. Successful people have the ability to make tough decisions. We quoted last week where Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He made a decision right there and then that impacted his family, impacted generations to come. You've got to understand something. One decision can change your life forever. One decision can change your life forever. And today I want to talk about the fact that successful people see life as a journey and not a destination. I want you to hear that. Successful people see life as a journey and not just a destination. With an understanding, or should I say, when we come to this understanding that life in general is made up of everyday decisions. Every single day, we make decisions that affect our lives. Every day, in terms of us reaching our goals, reaching the plans and purposes that God has for us, you don't just wake up tomorrow and you're successful, by the way. What happens is there's a, a progression of decisions. There's a, a progression of work. There is a walk towards your destiny. You don't just wake up one morning and you own a business. It takes planning. It t there's things that happen in your life in order for you to achieve what you want to achieve. It's called a journey. Just because you're going through a battle right now does not mean that you're not successful. You see, the journey is not just victory, 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 victory. The journey goes like this, battle, victory. How can you have a victory if there's no battle? I want you to understand that, grasp this, get this into your spirit. How do you enjoy a victory if there's nothing to be victorious over? Ladies and gentlemen, we, so, we get so caught up in the battles, our focus becomes the battle. We forget that that battle has been set up in order for you to achieve a victory in Jesus Christ's name. You see, what the enemy, we're saying it, has meant for evil, God has the ability to turn around for your good. I want you to stop looking at the battles as a point of being unsuccessful. No, the battle is part of the journey that will lead you to success. You see, you, you, we, we, how do you call, how do we call ourselves overcomers if we've got nothing to overcome? You see, we, we are called to be overcomers. We are called to have victory. We need to understand that 
Yes, we have a vision, but the vision also requires us to move. For example, and we've got this wonderful family that decided to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. You heard about them? Gloam, Oliver's? Can you imagine they, the two Gloams, Gloam Senior, Gloam Junior, decide, imagine this, they decide, we're going to climb this mountain. They stand at the bottom of the mountain. They're like, woof, this mountain's ours. Yo, this mountain, I can't wait to get to the top. But could you imagine a year later, they're still standing at the bottom of the mountain going, sure, I can't wait. Yo, this is going to be exciting. When we get to the top of the mountain, this is going to be amazing. Yes, they might have the vision. They might see the destination, but they haven't started the journey. There are too many Christians today that see a vision, that see purpose, that see plan, but you have not started the journey. And we need to realize that the journey starts when you take that first step of faith. You see, you can stare at the mountain as long as you want, but until you take the steps to actually climb the mountain, it will only be a vision and never a reality. I want to set someone free here today. God has given you a vision. God has set purpose in your life. But here's the thing. You will never see it happening until you realize it should be, it must be a reality in your life. What is the purpose of having vision if it just stays a dream? Ladies and gentlemen, we got to start making our dreams, our vision a reality. It's like the person that says, oh, I'm going to start this business. Yes, God has given me a desire, he's given me plans to do this business. But all you do is see a plan and never put the plan into action. Church, if we say the vision is the gospel, well then let's Get off our butts and start preaching the gospel. Too many people are saying, oh, yes, this is God's plan. This is what God wants to do in this world. We say it, but we do nothing. Successful people see life as a journey and not just a destination. Roy T. Bennett said these words, it doesn't matter how many times you get knocked down. It doesn't matter how many times you get knocked down. All that matters is that you get up one more time than you were knocked down. That's powerful. For someone, you've got to hear that. For someone, you've got to see that. It doesn't matter how many times you get knocked down. It's what matters is how many times you get back up. Because if you get up one more time than you've been knocked down, you're a victor. You're a winner. You're an overcomer. In Jesus' name. Most people will be disappointed, by the way. It, you'll keep on falling. You're going to keep on getting hurt. If we do this, we stare at the vision. We stare at the mountain and never look around us. It's dangerous. Try it one day. Okay? Try it one day. Try climb and just go, oh, no, no. I promise you, the problem with walking, I'm just watching me, I'm going, <laughs> I don't want to fall. But you know, you, that, that, and that's a good illustration. If I did what I was preaching now, I would fall and probably take the camera with me. You see, here's the problem. We got to have a vision, but we also at the same time got to look around what's happening. For example, if you drive to Durban, from Cape Town to Durban, and you're following a car, and all you do when you're driving is just stare at that number plate, that's all you do. You see nothing but the car in front of you's number plate. How many people know that journey is going to be very long? Very long. Your eyes are going to get sore. You're going to get tired. I'll tell you what, everything about that journey is going to be horrible. But if you take the journey and you make that journey part of your holiday experience, so in other words, what you do is you take a look around what is around you while you're driving. Not saying all the time, by the way. <laughs> you got to keep your eye on the vision. But every now and then you choose to stop and like I challenged last week to smell the flowers. That journey is part of your holiday. The journey becomes part of your victory. It's like... These well-meaning Christians, that all they do is wait for the end. There are, there are Christians today, their only focus is heaven. 
Now, you might say, but Pastor Ryan, that's right. We should have, of course, the end goal is about the kingdom. The end goal is about God. But did you know God has called us to still live now? You're not dead now. You're alive now, which means that you're supposed to have an impact now. It's supposed to be kingdom of God now. It's supposed to be us ushering in the presence of God now. You don't have to wait till you die to get into the presence of God because the Bible says, do you not know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? That means you're in the presence of God. You don't have to enjoy, just enjoy the presence of God when you're dead. You're alive now and you can enjoy the presence of God now. Too many people, too many Christians are like, oh, can't wait to die, pastor. Take this final breath and I'll be in the presence of God. No, 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 you don't have to die to enjoy the presence of God. We should not be the Christians that got these big banners saying, Jesus coming back tomorrow, you're going to die today, you're never going to heaven. No. We should be the Christians that say, do you know what, that God is still good today. He's going to be good tomorrow as well. He was good yesterday, He's good today, and He's good forevermore. His love will change your life forever. Too many Christians are so focused on the end times, they've forgotten they're living in the times now. A guy named Arthur Ashe said these amazing words. He said this, the doing is usually more important than the outcome. Powerful words, those. The doing is more, usually more important than the outcome. Let's use this for an example. Some people find success quickly, boom, just like that, by doing bad things. Some people can make a thousand rand by just picking a wallet and taking the wallet and scoring a thousand. They got victory. Come on, let's be honest. They got a thousand rand in a couple of seconds. You a thousand bucks. Didn't even have to work hard for it. Just took it out of God's pocket. Thousand rand. Some people find success by, by robbing, stealing, by fraud, and by all kinds of madness. Yes, there seems to be success because you got instant gratification. But the problem with that is, the Bible says, what you sow, you're going to reap. If your success comes from corruption, trust me, your success will be corrupted. I want to repeat that. I want you to understand. If your success comes from corruption, your success is corrupted. Matthew 6, 90 to 20 says this. Do not lay up treasures on earth for yourselves where moth and rust corrupts and where thieves break, in, break through and steal. But lay up treasures in heaven for yourselves where neither moth nor rust, where thieves do not break in and, and cannot steal. 1 Corinthians 3.13 says, each one's work shall be revealed, for the day shall declare it, it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try each one's work to see what kind it is. Ladies and gentlemen, even though we live now, we got to understand what we sow now, we will reap later. It will happen. When you focus on success as a journey instead of a destination, you, we all have the potential to experience many different sorts of successes every single day. You don't have to wait to arrive at your destination to enjoy the benefits of the journey. In fact, Many times on your way somewhere, you are blessed on your way somewhere. Your ultimate, oh, actually, let, me, let me say this. I wanted to mention this. What we have to learn is to rejoice in the small victories before we rejoice in the big victories. What I mean by that is sometimes we've got to be thankful for the little things before we achieve the big things. You see, God, God loves it when we are people full of thanksgiving. Where we wake up on a Monday morning and it's a beautiful day and we're thankful to God for the fact that He's given us another day instead of complaining, oh my word, it's Monday. You see, when we start rejoicing in the little victories, the big victory comes. What, the, what does the Bible say? 
if you are faithful with the little things, you'll be promoted to the greater things. Here's the problem. Often we don't thank God for the little things and we expect God to give us the big things. I want to challenge someone today. Take a pause, take a break in your life today. Reflect on what has just been said and how many times have we forgotten to say thank you Jesus that I can walk. Thank you Jesus that I can run. Thank you Jesus I can still see. Thank you Jesus that I'm still healthy. Thank you Jesus that I'm still alive today because of your grace. And let's see where that takes us. As you begin the journey, the first thing we must do in the journey is ask God to be with us. Ask God to walk with us. Ask God to give us wisdom. Judges 1 verse 8 says this, Then they said, Ask God whether or not our journey will be successful. Isn't that amazing? Why don't we wake up in the morning and the first thing we say is, God, today may we achieve success for you. May you walk with us. James 1 verse 5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who will give to all liberty with no reproach. It shall be given to him. I don't know about you, but if God is for us, who or what can be against us? Often we start the day in our own strength. Often we tackle the enemy in our own strength. Often we try and achieve success in our own strength. Isn't it amazing? Only after we get knocked down, only after the enemy pushes us to our to the floor do we then cry out god save me imagine if we started off with god be with me i hear music up here there we go nicole's alarms going up it's an amazing song nicole you play well on the keyboard and your cell phone plays well too look at that this is the thing if you were here with us this morning you would have experienced that okay so you make sure next week you're with us all right so let's carry on. Uh, I, I want to end off with my last point, and I'm almost finished, by the way, for those here and everyone inside here. And this is how I want to end. Successful people, while taking time to enjoy the journey around them, must and should still be focused on the future. In other words, successful people still have a vision. People with no vision are going nowhere in life. It's a fact. You see, here is an incredible tip in terms of success. Always keep on moving forward with the vision. Always keep on moving forward. The enemy's number one tactic with us, come on, let's be honest, the number one tactic with us to rob us of vision. Because if it can rob you of vision, you're going nowhere. You're just going to go around a circle. Sadly, some people's long-range planning or long-range vision or goals is something like this. I wonder if we should go to Burger King or McDonald's on Friday. That's the only long-term vision that some people have. Where should we eat on Friday? Burger King or McDonald's? Let's see. Let me just say, ladies and gentlemen, that's not the long-term vision or planning I'm talking about. I'm talking about seeing where God wants you to be. Where does God want you to be? Look at your business for a moment. Just for a moment, those in the business world, look at your business. Where do you think God wants your business? Does it, do you think God wants it in the gutter? Or do you think God wants it to be successful and he's got no part in it? We've got to start looking ahead. We need to set up priorities that will allow us to achieve what God has called us to. May God, I wrote this down, may God never say this of my generation or of your generation. May God's word never be spoken about my generation in these words. Luke chapter 9, 41 uh, says this, and answering Jesus said, Oh, unbelieving generation, one having been perverted, how long shall I be with you. The message translation says this, what a generation, no sense of God, no focus to their lives. How many times do I have to go over these things? How much longer do I have to put up with this? I pray that God would never say that about my generation, that we are a generation lacking faith. We are a generation that lacks focus. We are a generation that does not push forward. I don't want God to ever say that about my generation. How about you? 
I don't want God to say that. I want God to look at my generation and say, that is a generation filled with faith. Even though they locked down the churches, even though they closed the church doors, they kept on going. They kept on preaching the gospel. They kept on shining the light in the midst of darkness. Let me just say, that's what I want God to speak about my generation. How about yours? I don't want to be a generation where God looks down and says, oh, where's the faith? Where is, why are you full of unbelief? Why are you not focused as a generation? Come on, church, rise up. Come on, generation, rise up and say, we will be a generation of faith. I think it's clear that God expects every generation to be a generation of faith. Philippians 3, verse 15 to 16, the message translation says this. So let's keep focus on that goal. Those of us who want everything God has for us, if any of you have something else in mind, something less than total commitment, God will clear your blurred vision. You'll see it yet. Now that we're on the right track, let's stay on it. Come on, church. Let's stay on the right track. Let's keep focused on what God has called us to be. Someone said, live the life of your dreams. Be brave enough to live the life of your dreams according to your vision and purpose instead of the expectation and opinions of others. Come on, stop listening to what the world is saying and focus on what God is saying to this generation right now. Helen Keller said this, the most pathetic person in the world is someone who has sight but no vision. Come on, we got to be people of vision again. we got to start seeing what God has in store for us. I don't want to be part of a generation where there's no faith. In closing, I want to read something to you. This is not going to be on the projector. And perhaps I can have someone just on the keyboards for a moment. I want to read something to you that really challenged me in terms of vision, in terms of going forward, in terms of enjoying the journey while we're approaching a destination. I want to read this and hopefully it challenges you like it challenges me. This is what it said. Throughout the centuries, there were men who took first steps down new roads armed with nothing but their own vision. Their goals differed, but they all had this in common. That the step was first, the road new, the vision unborrowed, and the response they received was one of hatred. The great creators, the thinkers, the artists, the scientists, the inventors stood alone against me the men of their time. Every great new thought was opposed. Every great new invention was denounced. The first motor car was considered foolish. The airplane was considered impossible. Electricity was seen as something vicious and to be feared for. Anesthesia was, was considered sinful. But the men of unborrowed vision went ahead. They fought they suffered, they paid a price, but they won. They won. Church focus can be simply defined as something that has your attention. Whatever has your attention, that is your focus. Right here in this building, those on Facebook right now, I want to ask you a question. What has your attention? You see, the thing that's got your attention will either give you peace when you sleep or it's going to keep you up all night. What is it that has your focus? Is it God and His kingdom? Or is it fear? 
God isn't. Today, I want to declare that our focus, our vision in this generation needs to be, it has to be, I compel you to, to be the kingdom of God. Your business, your ministry, your family, your finance, everything needs to be focused into the kingdom of God. Every eye closed, every head bowed. Those on Facebook, I want you to focus right now. Those on YouTube a little bit later, I want you to focus right now. I call us all to repent where our vision has been blurred. I call us to repent if we've been focusing so much at the end, we haven't even enjoyed what God has for us now. I call us to repent and to once again put God first in our living now, our purpose now. I'm going to pray, and right there where you are, as I'm praying, I want you to pray. I want you to allow God to come into your life. If you've never given your heart to Jesus, this is an opportunity in this day, right here in this moment, to say, God, you are going to be my priority. Why? Because I am your priority. You love me. And Lord, I love you in return. So Father, right now in this place, right now on Facebook, I bring your sons and daughters to you. And I first of all pray for those who do not know you, that today will be the day that they choose to focus on you. I love what the Bible says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord, they will be saved. And I pray that anyone listening to this message who does not know you, that all they would simply do right now, I challenge you to do this, right now is to call upon the name of Jesus. Just call upon Jesus. Call Jesus to you today. Jesus, come into my life today. Today, Jesus, I want you to be my Lord and my Savior. And for us sons and daughters today, Lord, we call to you. We call for us to set our focus, our vision on you. I thank you, Lord, that as we're on this journey, that Jesus you would be with us in the journey and you would be the destination of our journey. I thank you that Lord today as we realign our focus, as we realign our vision, that Lord we would see a victory. We would see our enemy flee and we'd see God in the midst of everything. So we honor you and praise you for your goodness today. Thank you for challenging us. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone says, Amen. Those in the building, those on Facebook, Lord bless you. Thank you for being with us today. My prayer is that those who will join us a bit later on, on YouTube at 5 o'clock would receive exactly what we've received. And don't forget a reminder, next week, 8 o'clock, half past 9, here in the building, 3 o'clock at the Daily Restaurant. Don't miss out. Blessings. Amen.